Hello, everyone, and welcome to the ELEX webinar, Preserving Your Family History. I'm Carmen Koick and a member of the ELEX Preservation Outreach and Continuing Education Committees, and I will be your host for today's webinar. Our presenter today is Kenyatta D. Barry. Kenyatta is a native of Detroit, a graduate of Michigan State University, and the author of the Family Tree Toolkit, a comprehensive guide to uncovering your ancestry and researching genealogy. And she is also the host of the PBS show, Genealogy Roadshow. She works to bridge the gap between genealogists and historians, a merging of professions that she deems significant and necessary. In addition, Kenyatta has been featured in the pages of Real Simple, Black Enterprise, Jet, the Wall Street Journal, the Orange County Register, and the Sacramento Bee. She has been a guest on numerous radio programs, including Women's Wednesday, Make It Plain, and Extreme Genes on Sirius XM Radio. Most recently, Kenyatta has appeared on the docuseries For Pete's Sake on the OWN Network and Fox's The Real, where she revealed DNA test results of the show's hosts. A few logistics for today's presentation. All attendees are muted to prevent background noise, and we do not have interactive chat capabilities. We will be stopping periodically during the webinar to answer questions, and the attendees are encouraged to post their questions for Kenyatta in the question box. In addition, you may also comment on today's presentation using Twitter, and we have our hashtags up here. The first is the ALCTSCE, and then we have the Preservation Week hashtag, which is hashtag PRESWK. Now, this webinar is being recorded, and you will receive an email with links to the recording and presentation slides shortly after the presentation concludes. And now, here's Kenyatta. There will be a slight delay as we change presenters. Great, thanks so much. I'm excited to be here today to talk about preserving your family history for Preservation Week. Um, as mentioned, I'm Kenyatta Berry, native of Detroit and author of the Family Tree Toolkit. Sorry about that, having a little technical difficulty. There we go. <laughs> um, so it is Preservation Week, April 21st to, to the, excuse me, 21st to the 27th. Um, um, I highly encourage you to go to the website below to get more tools and find out more about Preservation Week. It's often hard when you're doing webinars because uh, you don't see the audience, but for those who haven't seen a photo of me, this is one of my favorite photos. It's also the photo used for Preservation Week, as well as a photo on the back of my uh, book. So let's get started. So what we're going to talk about today, just to give you a brief overview, is why it's important to know your family history. I want to share with you my genealogy journey, um, which is different than most. Also, how to interview family members, uh, what information you can glean from that, the records that are available for research, and resources for research. Also, we're going to talk about the big hot topic, DNA, and give you a little bit overview of that. And then once you do all this information, how do you tell your family story? So the importance of family history. It creates a connection to your past. I'm sure you all have stories or recall, uh, you know, maybe at family reunions or gatherings, people talking about the ancestors, whether it was a great aunt or a great grandparent, right? When you start researching your family history and preserving it, it creates a connection to that past. One of the things that I've done um, recently is my great grandmother was born in a little town called Leroy, New York, and she left and went to Detroit, which is where I was born. My mother was born and my grandmother was born. Once my great-grandmother died, we really had no connection to Leroy. But it was a big part of our life. Like, I had been there before, but I was much younger. So now what I've done is I started to create a connection with my cousins in Leroy. So that's been really cool to uncover their stories and then reconnect with family members. You also may discover some common family traits. What I mean by that is, for example, when you start looking at records, you get to know the occupations of family members, you get to know things about their uh, interests, so you may discover some of those interests are similar to yours. 
one of the biggest things that I try to tell people is why it's important is for medical slash health history. So for those on the phone while we're attending the webinar, if you have someone in your family that does not want to share the family history, um, I have my own personal story. Uh, my last name is Barry, and I have my mother's name. Well, every time I do a presentation or go out, someone's always like, oh, where are your berries from? I really can't tell them because my a grandfather, who's still alive in 92, uh, doesn't want to share that family story or that family information, right? So we will all have someone like that in our family. Not sure why, <laughs> but uh, it's one of the things that has happened. And then everyone has a story. It's so important when you're doing this work to tell that story and share that story. And by doing that, that helps create a connection between different generations. And then once you connect to your past, you become a student of history. I did not have an interest in history, but once I was able to put my family in that context of American history, I just started to love history and, and wanted to know so much more about it and about things that happened. And last but not least, it's fun. That's why I've been doing it for 20 years. It's also very addictive. So once you start, you may be up until 3 a.m. Uh, looking at a website trying to find information about your family. So how I got started doing genealogy, I was actually in law school. I went to Thomas uh, Cooley Law School in Lansing, Michigan, and I used to study at the Library of Michigan. And one day I'm doing tours and contracts law, and at the time I was dating someone whose uh, middle name was Dewelly. And I'd known that his family was very famous, or prominent, I should say, in Augusta, Philadelphia, in Atlanta. So I, I thought, I'm going to stop doing this and I'm going to look at his family because my family are just farmers from Virginia and New York, right? So I didn't think they had a story to tell. But as I found out years later, they do uh, and still do. So this is George Henry Dewelly. Uh, he was born enslaved in uh, Georgia. And what really got me hooked is this is, was probably around 1996. So it was before the internet. It was, you know, when you had to write to town clerks. But at the Library of Michigan, there was access to a biographical database. And from that database, I was able to find this information. Now, this is a book that I think is really important if you're doing research on someone that was at, that is African-American, was African-American um, in history. So it's called The History of the American Negro and His Institutions. There are probably about seven editions. Uh, this gentleman, A.B. Caldwell, have folks go out to interview people. So some of these uh, stories you get, you're typically getting it from the person. Okay, give me one second. I apologize. Okay, got it. Um, sorry about that. So hopefully uh, things have been resolved in my audio, but George was born in Columbia County on January 26, 1833. His father was a white man, C.J. Cook, and his mother was an enslaved woman named Mary Thomas. Why this is so important is because this is the type of information you normally just don't find out about enslaved people. Um, most folks have to work for years to get this information. But I was intrigued by it because he outlived three wives and I thought this is a great story to share and a great story to tell. So that's how I got my start. Most people get their start, like the folks that are watching the webinar, during their own family history. But I got my start because I thought this was more interesting than my own family. So some of the top genealogical myths that we hear um, and things that I'm not going to get in on soapbox about it, but one is that I could find everything related to my family online. Um, and that's not true. There's a lot of information online and we will talk about those online resources. I will make sure that I share that information with you. Um, but not everything is online, right? Not everything has been digitized and indexed. So it's often important for you to go to the county where your ancestors were born and go to the courthouse because that was where the business of the day um, was. 
Also, this is the one we get the most. We always get this. And it's funny when I tell people what I do, I always ha have this, well, I'm Native American ancestry. I'm not saying the person doesn't, but for some reason, it seems to be the most common. And even doing Genealogy Roadshow, we do have guests come on. And this is one of the things that they would mention to us. Another myth is that enslaved individuals often took the names of the enslavers, okay? That's not necessarily true. There are exceptions to the rule for that, but just if your family was enslaved, you can't necessarily look at your last name or your surname and say, my family was enslaved by the Berry family, right, in Georgia. Um, one of the big pet peeves of mine, again, doing African-American genealogy is records do not exist for people that were enslaved. That's not the case, they do, but they exist in places you may not normally look for them. One of the things that I do in the work I do is I work with a lot of universities. Well libraries, special collections, they often get things donated to them, right? And those things are may not be available online, so you have to physically go there. But most of the time when I do find things, there are records for the enslaved, and those typically come from the universities. And they're going to be in courthouses, and wills and probates and things like that as well. The other big one is that our family name was changed at Ellis Island. That's also a myth that's not true, okay? So that's not what generally happens. Um, so that one we kind of, I'll just leave there. And then the other is that family trees on the internet are accurate, okay? So one of the things about this one is when we all started out, when I started out doing my family history years ago, and when you start doing yours, if you haven't already, you're gonna find there are a lot of trees online, right? A lot of people who may have researched that same ancestor. But what started to happen, especially um, with ancestry, for example, is that people would just take information from a tree that someone already already researched. By taking information from a tree that someone already researched, right, when you don't know if they cited their sources, where they got that information, and attaching your tree to it and making it seem as though, you know, they're now your cousin or their information is accurate, right? So that makes it harder for you down the road. I mean, one of the mistakes that I made when I started was not attaching trees, but not documenting where I got the information from, right? And we'll talk about interviewing people, but make sure you document where the information came from. All right, so let's get to interviewing family members. So there are a lot of people that you can really talk about your family history. Um, within my book, I have a list of questions you can ask folks, but you know, talk to your parents, your grandparents, and if your great grandparents are still alive. Talk to, talk to your aunts, your uncles, your cousins, right? Um, there's always someone in the family that's doing family history. There's always one person, right, um, that may know something. So I would interview them and contact them. And then family historians, right, and town historians. When I started to look at my family in Leroy, I wrote a letter to the town historian. She just happened to live across the street from my uh, first cousin three times removed. And she got me all the information, I still have the paper today, on my family in upstate New York, as I mentioned that we had lost the connection to. Um, clerks as well, right? If you go to the courthouse, you're gonna talk to clerks. And then the other thing is, of course, librarians, right? They have the information, they have these things available. And I love that's where I got my start at a library and doing my family history. And they would know things about the area. Right. One of the other tools that I use, especially in a certain county, if there's a university, I always look for anyone that's written a dissertation or a thesis on the area about something I'm interested in. So how do you interview folks? Um, you can do formal or informal. Formal meaning you have a list of set questions or informal just saying, tell me what you remember. Right. Um, some of older folks may just want to do a telephone interview. They may not want to do a video one, but you can also do uh, Skype interviews as well, right? Some of the tools that are available, uh, Story Glory is one that I've used before, but there's also uh, just using your phone, right? Your iPhone or your Android. And then as I mentioned, video conferencing. All right, I'm gonna pause here to see if we have any questions. Okay, so if any of the attendees have questions, go ahead and put those in the question box now, and we'll hand those questions over to Kenyatta. 
We do have one question already, Kenyatta. It says, uh, do you know any resource that can be used to trace Native American histories? Yes, um, so there is the um, Oklahoma History Center, I wanna make sure I get this right, um, in Oklahoma City. They have a number of resources um, that are available on Native American ancestry and they can provide you guidance. Um, there's also been certain books that have been written um, about Native American ancestry. Um, so one of the things I would suggest is Oklahoma History Center and then looking for genealogy books about Native American ancestry. It's also one of the tough ones, right? As I talked about, everyone thinks that they're Native American, but it's also one of the places, you know, one of the, some of the records are available online, but a, a lot of them are not. So if you have Native American ancestry, you probably physically have to go to the location um, or to some other resource. Okay, our next question is, we have a few questions about story glory. Um, a lot of people not hearing about it and wanting to know um, if you could expand a little bit more on it and why you like it. Sure, so um, I learned about them at Roots Tech. And the one thing I like about an iPhone app, obviously you may have an Android one as well, but I have an iPhone. Um, so I met with the founders and if people are not familiar with Roots Tech, let me take a step back. So Roots Tech is one of the largest genealogy conferences in the country. It's typically held at the end of February in Salt Lake City. What you have at Roots Tech is you have a number of companies that are coming out um, to Roots Tech to basically get genealogists to use their product, whether it's something like Story Glory where you're recording something, you know, I interviewed my mom, recorded that, and was able to share that, uh, copy, share that with her and share that with other folks. Um, but there are a lot of apps out there that handle kind of video interviews and just trying to preserve your family history. So I learned about Story Glory at Roots Tech and because I learned about them early on, I used them to interview um, my mom and then also my dad uh, who has since passed on. So I like the ease of the application is pretty much the reason why I use it. But it's really kind of an interviewing storytelling app. Okay, our next question is, when interviewing people from abroad who may not speak English, do you mm -hmm. have any suggestions for how to communicate? I would suggest if you're inter interviewing people from abroad um, that do not speak English, I would suggest that you get, write down a list of questions. And then what I normally do is use Google Translate um, and then send those questions to them, whether it's via email or something like that, uh, or if there's someone that can interpret it for you. But that would be my, that was what I would do, is use Google Translate for that. Okay, and then our last question is, when you discover that some information is inaccurate, how do you go about correcting it? <laughs> um, great question. Uh, all good questions, actually. Um, Okay, so when you discover some information isn't accurate, when I talked about George Dewelly and the book by A.B. Caldwell, I have met people who have had families in different uh, versions of that book, right? So their families from Virginia or South Carolina, and they know the information is inaccurate, right? For something like that, a, a resource that was printed in the 20s, it's very difficult to do that. If you know something's inaccurate on someone's tree, right? So there's someone connected to you, you've seen their family tree, they've made it public, I would contact them, right, to get that, uh, to talk and show them why it's inaccurate, right? Don't just say your information is wrong, but kind of prove out your case um, on the research that you've done. Now, if you have documents, you find birth certificates or death records that are inaccurate, and we'll talk about those in, in, a, in a minute, um, that's going to be something you need to work with either vital statistics or the health department within that state to correct. So I went over three quick things, right? If it's a printed resources resource that was done some time ago, it's very difficult to correct that. If it's someone's family tree, feel free to reach out to them nicely and then uh, go over what you have researched and why you believe it's inaccurate. And then if it's a, a vital record or document, contact the vital statistics or health department in your state. Okay, so that's all of our questions for now, Kenyatta. Great, thanks. All right, so let's get into documents for research. So most people are familiar with census records. Census records are currently available from 1790 to 1940. 
The 1940 census was released, I believe, in 2012, and it's free and available online. So here's some of the resources um, for census records. When you're looking at census records and we're talking about inaccurate information, oftentimes you will see a pattern. There's a couple of things. Ages will change. Someone could be 55 in 1930, and then they're 75 in 1940. How they age 20 years. Depending on the enumerator, right? The person is actually doing the census. They, that family may not have been at home. They may have just wrote down inaccurate information. I've seen this across the board with census records. So while they're a great resource, you have to not use them as the, as the one that's only right. You support that information by trying to find birth, marriage, death records if they're available. But it's a great place to start. The other thing with the census, when you're looking at census records, a lot of times what we do is we just look at folks that are um, in the household, right? So I look at the parents, the children, maybe the grandparents are there. We really don't kind of slide to the right a little bit more and look at their occupation, their military service. All of these things are available on census records. Um, so I would encourage you to not just look at the head of household, but actually analyze the data that's in the census. So the important things to remember is that 1790 to 1840 only lists the heads of the household, right? So the other folks in the household were identified just by their age, were identified by age. Um, uh, age and sex, I'm sorry. 1850 to 1870 lists all, all individuals in the household but no relation. This is important because um, when you get to 1870, if you're doing African American research, there's something called the 1870 brick wall. 1870 was the first census to enumerate um, former enslaved people, so the four, four million. But they could be in a household with someone they're not related to, right? Because that's not listed on 1870. So you can't assume if you see folks in a household, especially in 1870 for African Americans, that they are actually related. Then 1880 to 1940 lists all the individuals in the household and their relationship. And we have a big gap um, with the 1890 census uh, not being available. One of the things you can use, um, there was a uh, veterans um, census that you can look at from folks from the Civil War. So vital records, I keep mentioning these. These are birth, marriage, and death records. They're available by state and when the, the time frame is all over the map. Um, one of the things that kind of was important to me to include in my book, but also gave me pause, was a vital records kind of list by state. One of the things we've seen as genealogists is that because of identity theft and other things, a lot of states are really trying to close records, right? So you have to know for the state you're looking at, right, where they're available. I mentioned either vital statistics or health. This is also for birth. It was sort of standardized around 1911 to 1912, but a lot of folks didn't actually do it. Um, my grandmother was born uh, in 1930, and I wasn't able to find her birth record from Arkansas. Again, marriages available by state. Um, marriages also, depending on where you're researching, could be available at the county level, right? So in some states, it, they started taking uh, marriage records or recording marriage records at the creation or formation of the county. Again, when you're doing this family history, you're going through this stuff to preserve your family history, you have to really know your state and your county as well. And then death certificates, one of my favorites, we'll get into this. Um, again, by state, they're in family Bibles, um, and doesn't mean you're necessarily gonna find one either if it wasn't filed, as well as standardized around 1911 slash 12. Now, death certificates. These are only as good as the informant, okay? And what I mean by that, when we're talking about documents, right, and if you find some information is wrong. Well, the informant, and this is for my great-grandfather, Nathaniel Lockhart Jones, excuse me, he was born in Louisiana, so I know his father's name and his mother's name is correct because I've done that research. Um, and then you get the informant. Sometimes you'll have a death certificate which has unknown on it for parents because the person informing uh, at the time didn't have that knowledge. He was pretty young when he died, 
and he had moved from uh, Louisiana to Texas, where he died in Longview, right? So this is a sample of the information you can get. It's, if it's done correctly, it's a wealth of information. I get his birth date, his death date, his parents' names, what he did, where he worked, all of that information just from this one document because this person, this informant, knew him. So again, death certificates, great resource, but only as good as the informant. And let's get to immigration and naturalization. So records are available at the National Archives. Um, there are also uh, records available online, passport applications. Those are really cool because they actually include a photo of the person. Uh, passenger list are all is available as well. So the precursor to Ellis Island was Castle Garden. And Castle Garden has a website where you can find information and passenger lists. So these are going to be the list of the people that entered into the U.S through Ellis Island, Castle Garden, other places, right? Um, and then here's, again, some resources online, a list for you. So a sample. One of the things we did on Genealogy Roadshow is when you think of Ellis Island, you kind of think of a lot of Europeans. You don't think of folks coming from the Caribbean, right? And most, even I did this, didn't think that people of African heritage uh, would be coming through uh, Ellis Island, but they did. So one of the attendees, uh, or attendees, excuse me, one of the records from the Dwelly family is uh, Eunice Mondale. So this tells you where she was, her nationality, her last place of residence, when she arrived, how old she was, right, down to the month, uh, whether she was single, um, the ship she traveled on. Now, when you're looking at immigration records, right, or something like this, Typically, in newspapers, there might be information on the ships that were coming in, right, and where they were coming from. So don't just look at this record and say, oh, I have this information, and don't pay attention to the ship, because you can find out a lot more information. And you can actually see a ship's manifest, right, or a passenger list. This has the word sample all over it, because if you wanted to get one from, um, I think it's Ellis Island, ellisisland.org, that they actually charge you for a very nice, pretty one. But using this as an example, this is what you can get for free. And then it tells you the line number she was on in the manifest. Once you look at the manifest, it would tell you where they're going and then whom they left home. So her talks about her mom. So I was able to get her mother's name as well. So military records. Military records are a uh, really good resource draft registrations for the Civil War, for World War I, World War II, and I'll show examples of these. Um, pension files are available from the National Archives. So if you're looking for a Civil War pension file, okay, at the National Archives, they're only going to have Union soldiers. For the Confederate States, you need to look at that state for pension files, okay? So again, National Archives is only for Union soldiers. And the other thing is with these records, with pension files, um, they could be 200 pages or five pages. It just depends. But they are not. Most of them are not available online, right? When you get to different states in the Confederate, that's it gets a little different in places like Tennessee and Mississippi. Obviously, the Revolutionary War pensions and the War of 1812 that people normally don't talk about as much. Um, but typically, if you want to be a part of the DAR, right? So the Daughters of the American Revolution and complete the application because your ancestor was part of the Revolutionary War, you would need to get this information. And draft registration and service records for the Civil War are available online at Family Search, Ancestry, and Fold 3. Fold 3 typically has a lot of military records in general, um, but they'll tell you there's some service records or muster rolls actually that are available there. So sample World War I draft registration. This is again for my great grandfather, Nathaniel Lockhart Hawthorne Jones, as it says on here. So on his death certificate, Hawthorne was missing, uh, a mouthful, and Junction City, Arkansas, and then where he was born, his birth date, which was consistent, and then what he did, who he worked for, where he worked, and if he had wife and children at the time that he needed to support. It would describe him, uh, his physical features, you know, medium, stout, color of his eyes, and his hair. What's interesting about this, if you notice on the ends, the ends are clipped, 
World War I draft registrations for folks that are African American are typically clipped at the end. So that's one sign as well. And then World War II. So you can see the difference between this one. This is my grandfather, his son, Lavelle Jones. It says how old he was, his date of birth, the city, right? And then it also talks about the name of the person who will always know your address. And he put his sister, Naomi Darden, and the relationship. And then where that person lived, right? I think this number seven, name of the person who will always know your address, is very interesting if you find out that that ancestor was married at the time, but they don't include their spouse, right? They include some other family member. And I've seen that happen, especially in my family as well. But then I get to know my grandfather worked at the Terry Dairy Company. And I used to remember him working at a dairy company in Detroit. So it was just so interesting to see this and say, oh, he started that back when he was in Arkansas, right? And when he was in El Dorado. Um, when he registered for this. So draft registrations um, for World War II, I think there were, I don't want to misquote, either four to six drafts. Um, and there was something called the old man's draft, right? Where folks that were much older were included as part of the draft registrations. So let's get to DNA. I'm sure we'll get a lot of questions about this. Um, for DNA, there's mtDNA, right, which is your D kind of distant maternal lineage. I did my first DNA test, which is my mtDNA from Family Tree DNA, probably around 2009, I believe. And I've done, of course, taken a DNA test at Ancestry, and I've also done 23andMe. Um, I believe for 23andMe, they used to offer these two tests, but uh, don't anymore. But anyway, so the mtDNA test is only for women. Right. Um, the Y DNA test is um, for men, and what that helps is it kind of tells your paternal lineage to the point where you're able to. There are a lot of surname groups, right? So folks who do Y DNA test typically join a surname group. So if there was a Barry relative, like if I got my grandfather to do a Y DNA test, right? We may see then he could be part of the Barry surname group, and we can look at folks that are related. Now, autosomal is one of the most popular, and with autosomal, it's your ethnic ancestry plus the connections to relatives on the branches of your tree. So autosomal is one is the one test that ancestry offers. So when people say I've done my DNA, right, they or I've done my genealogy, excuse me, they're typically talking about doing an autosomal test. And autosomal takes DNA from both of your parents. So with that. I'm gonna take a break again and stop to see if you have any questions as I went through those documents. Okay, so again, folks, if you have a question, go ahead and put it in the question box. Uh, we do have a few questions already. Um, the first question is about um, people who are adopted. So mm -hmm. dealing with adoption, um, any resources that they need to check that in addition to the things that you've already listed? Yeah, great question. I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, or submitted that, yes, DNA is something we always recommend for adoption. So for folks that are adopted, we do recommend you do a DNA test. Because when you do an autosomal DNA test sometimes, what the companies will do is they will match you against people in their database. And then you'll see, oh, this is my fifth cousin, my third cousin, my second cousin, right? That information may come up. So for adoptees, I definitely recommend that. The other thing I am with adoption is even for your checking, for the laws within the state where you were born and adopted. It may be the same state, it may be two different ones. So the laws often change um, based on this information. So I would check the laws for the state of the adoption and where the person was born. The other thing about DNA that I didn't mention, but I want to mention here, is with DNA, you never know what you're going to find, such as the same thing with genealogy. So because of that, I often encourage people to be ready for a surprise excuse me, a surprise. There are a lot of people um, who do DNA tests and then a half sibling comes up that they didn't know about. It happens more often than that. So here's a question. I'm not sure if you know the answer to it, but it's an interesting <laughs> question here. Someone has the hair follicles of a great aunt and they're wondering, is, there, is it possible for them to get a DNA report off of them? Um, I don't think so, but I would say that I'd have to research that one. I've had that question 
before, and I've heard mixed feedback from people that are, you know, really into DNA, that it's possible, and then some say it's not possible. But I would research that. I'm not sure you could actually send that into a company like Ancestry or 23andMe. And then speaking of those companies, is there one that you recommend over another in terms of Ancestry, a DNA, 23andMe, and et cetera? So for DNA, um, a couple of things. The company, so Ancestry probably has one of the larger databases because we've all probably, we've seen those ads, right? So Ancestry will give you, may give you more matches. Um, and it's the autosomal test. For 23andMe, um, what wasn't up there um, on my slide, but they have an Ancestry, um, an Ancestry test and an Ancestry plus health. So if you're looking to do your health or check your health, then I think 23andMe um, would, you know, I guess be one of the companies. And then Family Tree DNA is a company that I work with. Um, Family Tree DNA has been a sponsor of my uh, book tour. So full disclosure, it's, you know, I, that was where I took my first test. And I like Family Tree DNA because they do offer mtDNA, uh, Y-DNA, and autosomal. And they're actually the oldest company, DNA company, commercial DNA company. They're, they were founded in 1999 in Houston, Texas. So the next question is about military records, specifically from the 1950s and 60s, and wanting to know where's the best place to find those records. So for military records, um, unfortunately, they, there was, uh, I believe it was in the 70s, um, a lot of records were destroyed at the facility that had these military records. Um, the best bet, I would think, is to start with the National Archives. I always love their website because they have a lot of information. Um, so I would go to the Archives, National Archives website. The other thing I would do is look at FamilySearch.org has a wiki, right? And it's basically on their wiki. You can just type in uh, what information you're looking for. So I always recommend that as well. And then learning more about, um, you know, where they served. Uh, to see if there are any other records uh, in those locations. Now, speaking about the National Archives, someone wanted to ask, are U.S. passport applications available through the National Archives? They are actually available online at familysearch.org. Okay. And I believe Ancestry also has them. Familysearch.org uh, is free. So I talk about it a lot because I know some people may not be in a position financially to pay for um, access. And when will the 1950 census information be available? Do you know? Uh, yes, so the census is released 72 years at the date of enumeration. So it should be available in 2022. And another question we have is about recommendations for assessing records um, from Middle Eastern countries. Ooh. I am not familiar with records from Middle Eastern uh, countries. I would, again, go to the Family Search Wiki and check that out because I know FamilySearch.org does a lot of work around the world. Um, but that would be, yeah, I would check that out first. And there might be some books, um, genealogy books that talk about it, but I personally have never dealt with those records. And then the final question is, what is the best way to go about looking for Castle Garden records? Um, they are online, so just Google Castle Garden, and I, it may be castlegarden.org, you can just Google it, and then they'll, you'll be able to search right from the website. And I lied, we have one more question. Okay. <laughs> what are your best practices for organizing information that you have collected? Oh, that's a big question. Um, you know, when I started, I started out with just paper, so now I have binders full of stuff. Right. Um, I mentioned that letter from upstate New York. Today, I use uh, Dropbox to organize it. So Dropbox, very similar to Box, right? Um, you know, an online storage place. Um, I use Dropbox and I organized it by my maternal and my paternal ancestors. So each of the, so my mother has a folder, my dad has a folder. And then with each of those folders, I created folders for my grandparents and great grandparents. And if I found a third great grandparent, I created a folder for them as well. So that way I have, I have access online and at any time. So that's really how I've organized. Um, but 
I will, I will admit all the paper that I have, I haven't figured out how to organize that yet after 20 years of research. Okay, that's going to be it for questions. Great, thanks. All right, let's talk about the art of storytelling. Um, I like to include this because once we've gone through and done all those research, we have a lot of great questions coming in about resources and where to get things. And I believe that once you collect all that information, and I'm guilty of it myself, right? I talked about the binders and create these different things, um, ways to organize, but I really haven't until like a few years ago started telling my family's story. Right, so I have all this information about them as if they're just names, dates, and places on a census record or a vital record. But who were they as a person? So when we talk about preserving our family history, the great way to do that is to tell a story. It doesn't have to be a full book. It doesn't have to be something that's super long. You can tell the story um, of your family members and maybe just one little biographical, biographical excuse me, sketch. So it's storytelling for a positive change. One of the things that I like about Genealogy Roadshow is that we do tell those stories because they engage you. When you're doing genealogy work, or you're that person researching your family history, you might be alone in doing that work, which means that someone else in your family just really may not be interested. How do you get them inter interested and connect with them? And one of the ways to do that is to tell a story, to tell that family story so that it's not just, you know, in their minds, but it's in the emotions, the values, in their imaginations. So storytelling and genealogy, as I mentioned, um, you know, these things that we're talking about, these records, help create a picture of a person, right, of their life. But to get people to really be very, very um, engaged, we need to create sticky memories, right, by attaching emotions to things that happen. It was really interesting when I started doing, uh, we started doing Genealogy Roadshow to kind of get to the point where I was able to tell a person's story because I was so used to being in the documents. A lot of times genealogists uh, are usually people that are introverts. Um, we sit behind a computer looking for dead people or we go to a courthouse um, and get lost in the records. But how do you make it compelling to someone else? Right. Storytelling in genealogy is really I can sit here and do research for you and tell you about your family history. But that's going to be interesting to you. Is that going to be interesting to other people? Right. And how do you make it interesting? How do you preserve that? You preserve it by telling a great story. And one of my favorites um, is a woman named Gail Lukasik. She was in the second season of Genealogy Roadshow. She had done her research prior to coming on the show. And she started uh, sort of like me with microfilm and you know writing to places. And what I loved about Gail's story was during her research, she uncovered a family secret. And that family secret was that her mother who um, lived in New Orleans or grew up in New Orleans, um, had left New Orleans um, at some point in her 20s, I believe. And when she left New Orleans, she moved to Ohio. When she got to Ohio, because how fair-skinned she looked, she passed as a white woman. So Gail had no idea that her mother had any African ancestry. And what's great about Gail's story is her mother basically said, swore to secrecy until she came on Genealogy Roadshow. And when she came on Genealogy Roadshow, I revealed her family history to her. That was very rich, not just the things that she found out about her mother and her grandfather, but other, other things as well. And what makes this so compelling is that her mother, when she decided to move to Ohio, never really talked to her family again. Well, her father, Gail's grandfather, um, had gotten remarried because Gail's grandparents had gotten divorced. And when he remarried, he had four other children that her mother never knew. So by coming on the show, sharing her story, Gail was able to connect with her aunt, who was alive at the time, and her uncle that she never met and cousins she never knew. And because Gail is a writer, she wrote a book about it called White Like Her. And she tells this story of being on Genealogy Road Show and the additional research that she did. And it's changed her life. So these are the types of things that I love about family history is when you share someone's story and the information you get from that. And your story may be something different. 
So what makes a great story? It's starting with a message. Who is my audience and what do I want to share with them? And when you think of your audience, are you trying to connect with the younger generation where they take things in very small bites, right? You know, they don't do very long stories. Um, or are you really trying to reconnect to family members that you may not know? And that's, as I mentioned, the cousins I have that are in upstate New York in Caledonia. When I did a hometown tour for Genealogy Roadshow, I was able to connect with them. And it was really cool for me to do that and reconnect and get acquainted with their families and their family members. So my audience for that is I want to be able to tell them what I know about their ancestors that they never knew. And then what events, right? The things that are event-based, what events are we looking at? We had a question about military records from the um, 1950s. Are we looking at someone who was part of World War II? Um, what, you know, what event happened? Are we looking at someone that was a founder or prominent in a town? And then what is most compelling? What is most compelling to, to the person in your audience, right? The story of Gail Lucas that I briefly shared is compelling to others because they may have similar stories. It's compelling because she kept this family secret and you may find some family secrets and she waited to share it until after her mother passed on, but she has become so much richer in her life because of it. So that's why I think you should always be able to tell a great story. So then find your hero. Right, and what I mean by that is that the hero is you in the story, that's fine. But one of the heroes that I found was my third great grandfather, uh, John, uh, or excuse me, James Philip Sellers, JP. He was enslaved in Virginia, left Virginia and went to upstate New York. Everyone that I'm relating to in upstate New York started from that decision that he made to move for a better life in upstate. And so looking at what lessons did he learn? What events did he witness? Right? And sharing that story with someone, you can find one person, two people, or three people in your family history. But I think it's great to get their stories out there because a lot of people didn't have the ability to share their story. And you can share it in a way that people want to know more and, and you can inspire others to do their family history. So telling a great story is part of doing family history, preserving that family history, and making sure if you tell that story, the information is accurate. And I like this quote about one of the main reasons we listen to stories, because it creates a deeper belief of ourselves. So you can highlight a struggle. Um, something without a challenge doesn't need, isn't usually very interesting to others. Um, the story needs conflict. And then take people on a journey. You know, the story of Gail's mother taking as she writes it, and as we told it on Genealogy Roadshow, takes the viewers on a journey, right? And the conflict of it is that her mother left and passed for white, even though she had African ancestry, because she would have been considered Black in Louisiana, New Orleans, and she wanted better opportunities. And as part of that journey as well, is Gail being able to finally connect with those cousins that she had. The other thing is keep it simple. Less is more. If I talked about connecting with different generations as your audience, the less information, the better. And what I mean is that you don't need to write a book, you don't need to write a, you know, 20 pages. You can write something that's two pages, but you can get a great story and understand what is your core message in this story. And then also, you know, for the audience that you're sharing this with, it could be at a family reunion, right? That you're telling the story of an ancestor, but to keep their interest, you can have some good details, but humble beginnings, they came over on this ship or how experience may have impacted our ancestor helps us to share this information with our family and get them excited. I have sensed this or seen this, excuse me, in my own research, my parents, and my family did not like when I come around in Christmas and all I wanted to do was give everybody's information. But when I started to share the stories of what I discovered, they really, really appreciate it. And then they had a sense of pride in the folks that they didn't know and whose stories they didn't know. Again, with this, practice makes perfect. Find yourself a genealogy buddy 
It's really important to have someone that can help you look at your research, be your mentor, but also not think that you're too crazy that you're staying up to 3 a.m. on Ancestry.com. And they can help you fine tune your message, right? And I think that's important to, to do. So once you do share that story with your family members, they can really relate to it. So with that, if there are any other questions about storytelling or anything else that I've talked about um, in the webinar, please let me know. So this is your final chance to ask a question of Kenyatta. So if you have one, go ahead and put it in the question box. Now we have a few already here for you. Um, one of the first ones is saying, how do I preserve my researcher documentation when my immediate relatives are not interested? Writing a book, donating to archives, what do you recommend? So if your immediate relatives are not interested, I do, as I talked about storytelling, um, you could write a book or you could start by just writing a biographical sketch, a two page sketch, sketch on a particular ancestor. Um, as far as preserving your family history with the photos or documents, I would find a historical society, a genealogical society or a library that will take care of that family history and preserve it for you. Because even if you gave it to your relatives, there may be one person in your family today that might be interested, but then they need to pass it on to someone else. So that's one of the challenges in doing this work if you're the only person who's gonna take over the reins of it. So I think allowing that work to be accessible to future generations by giving it to institutions is really important. The next question is about privacy, about what information to keep private when creating a family tree. Uh, great question. So for information to keep private, I would definitely, I don't put a lot of information out about folks that are still alive. I also don't tell information that may cause some type of harm or pain. So in, for example, if you find out a family secret you have to kind of think about it in your mind. Do you want to share that family secret? Whether it happened, you know, 100 years ago, right? You could find out, we did a story about um, a gentleman who uh, ended up uh, killing his wife after coming back from the Civil War. It was well documented in a newspaper and he did it in front of the children and it was the trauma of all of that. That was a story that we shared on television, but if you find something that's heartbreaking, you may not want to share that. So I think you have to use your own kind of barometer when you think about, when you uh, do tell your family story. Now we have a question about soldiers uh, from World War I in regards to them having passport information. Uh, would they be able to access passport information because they went over to France, for instance, um, would the soldiers, um, in addition to having military records, have any sort of passport information? Um, yes, there would be some passport information. One of the Dwellies I found actually um, during World War I went over to uh, overseas and I found his passport application on familysearch.org along with the photo. Okay, now the next question is about going further back on your family's timeline. At a certain point, um, especially for Americans, um, we'll find that our uh, great-grandparents or great-grandparents have come from uh, international, right, have come here. So uh, this person's wondering if you have any resources that you can recommend for once, you know, our, our ancestors have moved on from the United States and we've gone further back and we need to search. Um, this person asked an example, their family has come from Poland. Mm, okay. Yes, yeah, so one of the things, first is to create that timeline, right? So have a, doc, have a timeline of when your family came over or how, back, how far back you can go in the U.S. And if you're looking at records um, from Poland, I know there are books that have been written about uh, doing the uh, European um, research and other immigration um, information. So that's not an area of expertise for me, but what I would also look at, as I mentioned before, that Family Search Wiki will tell you what records are available online and where you can get more records. Um, and I do believe that, like I said, a couple of books that have been written over the years about doing that type of research. Our next question is about the premise of a hometown tour, if you could explain uh, that in a little more detail. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, I kind of glossed over that. but. So the hometown tour, what I did for Genealogy Roadshow season three is I wanted to connect um, 
with my family. So I just reversed the course, as I called it. I went started in upstate New York and then went to Virginia and connected with cousins in both places. And it was a way for me to promote the show, but also to share some of my family history and tell the stories that they didn't know. So that was part of my hometown tour. And then it was great to have fans of the show and people that have known me over the years to come out and kind of hear that story. And when it, during one hometown tour, I actually met a bunch of my cousins for the first time. And I was more nervous about that actually than even doing my presentation. And during my presentation, I could tell they were taking photos of my slides and I'm like, I'll give, give them to you. I'm related to you. You know, I'm telling these stories and I'm talking about people that they knew growing up that lived in upstate. So that was part of my hometown tour. So here's what I think is a really great question for everyone. Um, what can I do to make things easy for my descendants when it comes to leaving evidence of my life? Yeah, well, write down your story. Um, that would be the first thing, right? Would, if you want, to, you want to tell your own story and not have someone tell that for you. So write down your story, significant things that have happened um, in your life, right? And, and make that available. And you can either self-publish that um, to, to let them know about your life. Like that's the thing that I think you can do today um, to help. The next question is about the earliest dates of birth certificates for those that were enslaved, if you know when the earliest dates would be. Oh, okay. For those that were enslaved, um, it's kind of difficult. So if someone was born enslaved, you might find a death certificate for them, and that may have a birth date on it. But most enslaved folks didn't know their birth date, um, which is unfortunate. And then, as I mentioned with the birth certificates, they didn't really start standardizing, standardizing those until 1911, 1912. Some of the areas were earlier, but for enslaved folks, finding out their birthday um, and their location of birth oftentimes can be challenging, but that's one of the things I liked about the biographical sketch for George Dwelly because it showed exactly where he was born, the date he was born, and who his parents were. And our next question is about um, accessing records that uh, you are not um, privy to. How do, when you require family members to file for information, how do you, how do you get around that uh, or get to that information? Um, so if you have to have family members to, to get that information, obviously working with them to tell them why it's important, maybe using that medical slash health history reason. The other thing is where you're trying to get the records from. A lot of the privacy laws that have changed uh, since the growth of the internet, since, you know, um, identity theft, have made it more difficult to get vital records about folks and require you to go through a lot of hoops to do so. I would check with the state vital statistics or health department to determine what you need to do. Um, once you've found that out and you know I need to get this family member on board, I would work on kind of slowly talking to them about it and why it's important and that really you're trying to find your family history. You're not trying to use this information to um, hurt someone. So we've had a few questions about talking to family members and getting conflicting stories about events. Mm -hmm. And um, how do you reconcile that? What's the best way to get the right information when you've been told uh, conflicting stories? So if you have conflicting stories in your family history, depending on the time period that you're researching, you may be able to back that up with documents. So that information could be backed up with a, a copy of a vital record. Uh, stories, I love newspapers. You can look in a newspaper. If it's a, if it's a salacious story or it seems like uh, one thing happened um, and they're saying another thing happened, you may be able to find older papers that document that event and, and what happened on that date and may have your ancestors' names. Um, newspapers were like, you know, the Facebook of the day. They wrote about a lot of people's business and, and the things that they did. So newspapers is one resource also looking again at the vital records and then also the census records, but taking those with grain of salt. And once you find out your conflicting stories and then you get to the bottom of it in one version, the person who gave you the wrong version, I would suggest um, kind of approach, seeing if you want to approach them and say, I found this information out. 
you know, because it may be the reason why they're telling conflicting stories is because it's a family secret or they don't, or, or they just don't know actually, because it's like a telephone game. Over time, people add things to things or uh, things change in their minds. So someone uh, did a DNA test and they found out that they had a niece that they didn't know that they had, and they wanted to know how they might go about finding out um, where she was adopted, like her adoption process. Interesting. Okay. Um, I would suggest if you want to figure out her adoption process, um, I'm assuming this person has had a connection or contact with this niece. Um, if that is the case, then I would, you know, work with her on that. Um, I would also, if the, if the person, you know, in your family whose child this is, is still alive, then I would have a conversation with them as well. When you're dealing with adoption, it can be very challenging and sensitive because some people don't want other people to know what happened. Maybe they were very young, um, but I would definitely work with her and then try to figure out the family members where she was adopted. And the next question is about um, resources for searching for photographs of African American ancestors. So photographs of African American um, ancestors, you can find some of those I mentioned in that book. How I, that's how I found one photo of George Dewelly. Right, but that was because he was written about because he's this prominent pastor in Augusta, Georgia. Um, the other way to do that is I've seen that, um, I've seen it in some newspapers for African Americans. There are a lot of African American newspapers that are not published today, but are available online at newspapers.com. And I think it's Chronicling America as well. I would look at newspapers to see if there are any African-American newspapers where your ancestors lived, because that's how I found out a lot of information about the lives of my family, by looking at the newspapers um, in their areas. And then our final question is, are there episodes of Genealogy Roadshow online for us to view? Yes, there are. If you have Amazon Prime, you can view them as well. And I do think there's a couple online at uh, YouTube. And sometimes they do rerun the show on um, PBS. Okay, and that's gonna be it for questions. Great. Okay, so uh, before we go, just to uh, wrap this up. So let's do a final thank you to obviously our presenter. to our presenter, Kenyatta, um, as well as to the ELECTS Continuing Education Committee, to Zip Nicholson and Wanda Jazieri, and to also um, Alana Warren from the ELECTS office. I do want to let everyone know about upcoming ELECTS Continuing Education opportunities. If you go to the ELECTS website, you can see um, all the upcoming webinars we have for uh, spring 2019. We do have another uh, webinar for Preservation Week coming up on the 25th, Caring for Family Keepsakes. And then we have a few other webinars in May as well. There are also web courses and e-forums that are available uh, at the ELEX website. Um, they're scheduled throughout the year on various topics and e-forums as well. And the next e-forum is on the 21st of May. And then finally, I want to promote the ELEX pre-conference at the ALA Annual. If you are going, it does take place Friday, June 21st, and it is on better networking for disasters, improving participation and coordination for disaster response and recovery. So if you are attending ALA and you do want to sign up for that, you can register for that um, through ALA Annual's website. And uh, that's going to be it for us. So thank you very much for joining us all today. And this concludes our session.